Hello and welcome to another lesson on A-level physics. Today's learning intention is to be able to calculate momentum change when an object rebounds. Today's success criteria is to calculate the change in momentum in a rebound collision, to apply the change of momentum to two dimensions, and to appreciate how rate of change of momentum influences the design of car safety features. So let's start off by determining what we mean by a rebound collision. Here I've got a cricket ball being thrown at a wall and obviously as you can imagine that ball is then going to rebound away so its direction has changed. Now if we consider the momentum of this, the momentum of the ball afterwards is in the opposite direction and that is significant because momentum is a vector. So to help us with the analysis of this I need to determine which direction is positive and which direction is negative. Just for the sake of ease, knowing that we read from left to right, I'm going to say that going towards the right is positive and going towards the left is a negative direction. Therefore, I can say that the initial speed of that cricket ball is going to be plus u because um, it's moving in the uh, positive direction. And then I'm going to say that the velocity afterwards is going to be minus v. Now, to simplify the argument later on, I'm probably going to say that there is no change in speed during the collision. But for now, that is how we have set up the problem. Now, we can consider what the initial momentum of that cricket ball is going to be. Uh, and the initial momentum will be its mass multiplied by its velocity, so mu. That means that the final momentum of the cricket ball is going to be minus mv, because it's minus, because it's moving in the opposite direction, and obviously the final speed is always denoted v. Now, we're going to look at what the change in momentum is. When we do a change in momentum, we always do the final momentum take away the initial momentum. So the change of momentum will be minus mv minus mu. But like I said, if we simplify this to assume that there is no loss of speed during that collision, then that will simplify to minus 2mu. Now from there, we can then work out what the force that the wall puts on the cricket ball is going to be. Because force is changing momentum divided by time, F will come out as being minus 2mu divided by t. Now let's consider a slightly more realistic example. It's not often that when you throw a ball it rebounds back exactly along the same line in, um, in one dimension. Quite often collisions are in two dimensions as I've shown with the cricket ball here. So the ball is being thrown at the wall and then it moves away at an angle. Again, I'm going to say that the initial velocity is going to be positive plus u and there's going to be no loss of speed when the ball hits the wall. Now, in terms of doing the mathematical argument, I've drawn on a normal line there at 90 degrees to the wall and I've labelled the angle between the velocity vector and that normal line as being angle theta. Now, I can consider what the initial momentum of that ball is. The initial momentum is obviously going to be mu, but I can split that up into two different components. I can resolve that velocity vector into a component that is parallel to the wall and a component that is perpendicular to the wall. I can do that if I use the laser pointer to show you the triangle that I'm considering here, splitting up this velocity vector into these two components here, this being a right angle triangle. The component that is going to be acting perpendicular to the wall is mu cos theta, and the velocity that is acting parallel to the wall is mu sine theta. Remember that it's cos theta when we're looking at the adjacent side, sine theta when we are looking at the opposite side in terms of resolving the forces. Now, once it has hit the wall, it moves away, as shown. Now, the component that is parallel to the wall hasn't actually changed. So we can say that we have still got a momentum of mu sine theta afterwards. But you'll notice that the component that is perpendicular to the wall will now be acting in the opposite direction. So that velocity, uh, that momentum now is minus mu cos theta plus mu sine theta. The change in momentum, therefore, then has to be the final momentum take away the initial momentum. And so we can say that the change in momentum is minus mu cos theta plus mu sine theta. And then we take away mu cos theta and mu sine theta. Obviously, plus mu sine theta and minus mu sine theta will cancel out with each other. 
but we have got two subtractions of mu cos theta, so the actual change in momentum during this impact will be minus 2 mu cos theta. Right, let's have a go at an example question then. So it says a tennis ball of mass 0.2 kilograms moving at a speed of 18 meters per second was hit by a bat causing the direction the ball goes in to change. Um, it came back at a speed of 15 meters per second. The contact time was 0.12 seconds and we've been asked to calculate the change in momentum of the ball. So to do that we work out the initial momentum by doing 18 times 0.2 which gives us 3.6 kilogram meters per second squared and then the final momentum because it's going in the opposite direction will come out as minus 3 kilogram meters per second squared. It doesn't matter which direction you take as positive or negative as long as you get the same magnitude change at the end. Remember that change in momentum has to always be final takeaway initial so in this instance we'll be doing minus 3 minus 3.6 which gives us a change in momentum of 6 minus 6.6 .6 kilogram meters per second. We now want to work out the impact force that is acting on the ball. Remember, we have an equation for that from the previous lesson. Force is with the rate of change of momentum. So we do minus 6.6 .6 divided by 0.12, which comes out as minus 55 newtons. Now we're going to look at a slightly more complicated task and an involved task that looks at safety barrier design. Safety barriers are used on UK motorways to prevent vehicles from crossing from one carriageway to the other. The barriers absorb some of the kinetic energy of a vehicle and deflect the vehicle along the barrier. The standard test of a steel safety barrier uses a vehicle of mass 1.5 times 10 to the 3 kilograms to collide with the barrier at 20 degrees at a speed of 110 kilometers per hour. The steel barrier can provide an average force of 60 kilonewtons at 90 degrees to the carriageway. The speed of the vehicle parallel to the barrier is unchanged. To pass the test, the barrier must not deform by more than 1.5 meters. So that's all the information about the test that we've been given and now there are four tasks that I would like you to complete. I would like you to calculate the component of the momentum of the test vehicle in the direction along the line of the safety barrier. I'd like to calculate the amount of kinetic energy lost in the collision, determine if this barrier is going to pass the test and then a different barrier uses a solid concrete that will not deform, discuss which barrier will be safer for the driver of the car. Pause the video, have a go at all four tasks please and then we will go over the answers. So the first thing that I've asked us to do is calculate the component of the momentum of the test vehicle in the direction along the line of the safety barrier. Now to do this I'm just going to get the laser pointer to show you the triangle here that I'm going to be interested in because that 110 kilometers per hour is going to be directed along this dotted line that's the actual speed of the vehicle now obviously there is a component of that that is perpendicular to the barrier and a component which is parallel to the barrier and it is this parallel component that I am interested in therefore when it comes to resolving that 110 kilometers per hour we will be multiplying it by cos 20 because that is the adjacent side of this triangle We'll get rid of the um, get rid of the laser pointer now. So first thing to do then is to convert 110 kilometers into meters per second. Now obviously we can do 110 times a thousand to get into meters per hour. Then we divide that by 60 to get into meters per minute, and divide it by 60 again to get into meters per second. So we should find that it comes out as 30.6 meters per second. And now to work out the component of the momentum that is along that slide. Uh, we need to obviously multiply that by cos 20 and times it by the mass as well because momentum is mass times velocity. So mv cos theta is going to be 1.5 times 10 to the 3 times 30.6 times cos 20 giving us an answer to that first task of 43,000 kilogram meters per second. We then wanted to calculate the amount of a kinetic energy that is lost in the collision. The easiest way to do that is to simply work out what the kinetic energy before the collision is and work out what the kinetic energy afterwards is. So the initial kinetic energy we find by doing a half times mass times velocity squared. So we do a half times 1.5 times 10 to the 3 multiplied by 30.6 squared. Obviously we're working in units of meters per second and that gives us an answer of 7.2 times 10 to the 5 joules. Now, it did tell us in the question that the speed of the vehicle parallel to the barrier is unchanged. So therefore, there is no loss of kinetic energy 
horizontally, if you like, in the line of the steel safety barrier. So we can then work out what the kinetic energy is because of its velocity in that direction. Obviously, its velocity perpendicular to the barrier would have been reduced to zero. So the final kinetic energy is a half times 1.5 times 10 to the 3 times by 30.6 cos 20 all squared comes out as 6.18 times 10 to the 5 joules. To then find out the amount of kinetic energy lost, we will subtract those two values and we will get an answer of 8.2 times 10 to the 4 joules. Okay, the next task said determine if the safety barrier will pass the test. Now the key to passing the test is that the barrier mustn't deform by more than 1.5 meters. Now we know quite a bit of information, we know what the speed of the vehicle perpendicular to the barrier is when it hits it, uh, or we can work that out at least by doing 30.6 times sine 20. We also know that the velocity of the vehicle is going to be reduced to zero, so we know two key pieces of information already. Now I would be considering doing a SUVA if I know an initial and final speed. I can also work out what the time of the impact is because I know that the force on the vehicle is 60 kilonewtons and I know what the change in momentum is going to be as well. So force is change in momentum over time. So I can do 1.5 times 10 to the 3 times by 10.5 and then divide that by 60 times 10 to the 3 which comes out as 0.263 seconds. Following on from this, I can then lay out my SUVAT uh, because I know what the, ver the velocity perpendicular to the barrier is as well. It's 10.5 meters per second. So S, U, V, A and T. Um, U is going to be 10.5 because that is the speed that is perpendicular to the barrier. V is going to be zero because it's been brought to rest perpendicular to the barrier. And the time of the impact as worked out from above is 0.263 seconds. Now, I can simply just work out S using a SUVAT equation. I would use S equals U plus V over 2 times T. Uh, substituting the values in, we've got 10.5 over 2 times 0.263. So the barrier would deform by 1.38 metres. So therefore, you can say that it will pass the test. An alternative method to this, though, instead of using F equals change in momentum over time, you could actually use F equals M times A uh, from Newton's second law, and that will give you a value of A instead of a value of T, and then you could have used a different equation, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS, to get the same answer uh, to the question. So that is an alternative method that you might have done. And then finally, it says a different barrier uses solid concrete that will not deform. Discuss which barrier will be safer for the driver of the car. Well, regardless of which safety barrier they collide, the actual change in momentum of the car is going to be the same in both instances. Uh, because obviously it's going from the momentum that it had to zero momentum in that direction. However, the impact time is going to be larger for the steel barrier because it deforms. Whenever you have a deformation, that means that the time of the impact acts for longer. Because the time is bigger, that would imply that the force on any dummies or any people in the car uh, is going to be smaller because force is changing momentum divided by time. So if you are dividing by a bigger time, that gives you a smaller force. So in theory, the uh, steel barrier will be better and safer for the occupants of the car than a concrete barrier would. Right, another task for you folks. I want you to list the features of car transport design that increase the safety of the occupants. And I'd like you to have a go at explaining how each of the features that you list works. So pause the video for me please and have a go at this task. Okay. So the first one that I thought of was airbags. Airbags in modern cars are designed to reduce the chance of injury to the occupants in an accident. Sensors detect rapid changes in acceleration that are associated with a crash and they trigger an explosive chemical reaction which fills an airbag with nitrogen in usually up to 30 milliseconds, so it's very quick. That provides a cushion for the occupant's head and upper body and that reduces the momentum of the occupant to zero more gradually than a sudden deceleration by contact with the dashboard or the windscreen would do and therefore that reduces the force on the person and minimises injuries. It's essentially the same, same physics concept as the uh, crash barrier that we've looked at previously. 
Another thing that you could have suggested would have been the bumpers. Bumpers give way uh, a little bit in an impact, and so again, that increases the impact time. The impact force is therefore reduced as a result of um, as a result of that because force is changing momentum over time. If the initial speed of the impact is too high, the bumper and or the vehicle chassis is likely to be damaged though. Uh, another suggestion that you could come up with is crumple zones and there is a recurring theme to how all of these work. The engine compartment of a car is designed to give way in a front end impact, that's what the crumple zone is. If the engine compartment was rigid, the impact time would be dead short, uh, so the impact force would be very large. But by designing the engine compartment so that it crumples in a front end impact, the impact time is increased and the impact force is again therefore reduced. You could have suggested seat belts too. Uh, a correctly fitted seat belt will restrain the wearer from crashing into the vehicle frame after the vehicle suddenly stops. The restraining force on the wearer is therefore much less than the impact force would be if the wearer hit the vehicle frame. With the seat belt on, the wearer is stopped much more gradually than without it as well. Seat belts do need replacing as well after a crash. Uh, side impact bars again working in exactly the same way because they deform when you hit from the side uh, that increases the impact time and so therefore reduces the force and we could have said collapsible steering wheel as well in a front end impact the seat belt restrains the driver without holding the driver rigidly if the driver makes contact with the steering wheel the impact force is lessened as a result of the steering wheel collapsing in the impact. Okay, what I'd like you to have a go at now, please, folks, is at least two sets of the following questions. Um, and then, obviously, I will go over the answers with you and you can mark your work. Okay, consolidation questions. Question one. A 2,000 kilogram lorry reverses at a speed of 0.8 metres per second and backs accidentally into a steel fence. The fence stops the lorry 0.5 seconds after the lorry first makes contact with it. Calculate the initial momentum of the lorry. Nice and straightforward question here. All we're doing is momentum is mass times velocity. So we do 2,000 times 0.8 which comes out as 1,600 kilogram meters per second. I know that sometimes students like to use uh, minus 0.8 meters per second because it's reversing. That would also be fine. That would just give you an answer of minus 1,600 kilogram meters per second, which would be absolutely fine. We then work out the force of the impact. Force of impact is changing momentum over time. So 1,600 over 0.5, which gives 3,200 newtons. Question number two. A cricket ball is travelling at a speed of 32.5 metres per second when it is hit by a bat. The speed of the cricket ball is unchanged but is travelling in the opposite direction. The mass of the ball is 0.156 kilograms. Calculate the change in momentum of the ball. Ensure you include an appropriate unit for your answer. So we've got to remember that change in momentum is the final momentum minus the initial and not the other way around. And now we need to take into account the directions. So the initial momentum we can say is 32.5 times 0.156, which gives a positive momentum of 5.07. But the final momentum, because it goes in the opposite direction, is going to have to be negative. So we can say that that is minus 32.5 times 0.156, which gives minus 5.07 kilogram meters per second. Therefore, the actual change in momentum is going to be minus 5.07, take away 5.07, which comes out as minus 10.14 kilogram meters per second. Okay, part B said the ball is in contact with the bat for 3.8 milliseconds. We want to calculate the force exerted by the ball on the bat. So force is change in momentum divided by time. Now the sign is important because that indicates the direction of the force. And so when we substitute in, we come out with an answer of 2,668 newtons. Standard demand. A car of mass 600 kilograms travelling at a speed of 3 metres per second is struck from behind by another vehicle. The impact lasts for 0.4 seconds and causes the speed of the car to increase to 8 metres per second. We want to calculate the change in momentum of the car due to the impact. Now quite handily in this situation there's actually no change in direction for the car so the sign isn't going to be too important. The change in momentum is therefore the mass multiplied by the change in velocity so we do 600 times 5 which gives 3000 kilogram meters per second. 
The impact force, we do force is rate of change of momentum. So 3,000 divided by 0 0.4, which comes out as 7,500 newtons. Question two. A molecule of mass 5 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms moving at a speed of 420 meters per second hits a surface at right angles to the surface and rebounds at the same speed in the opposite direction in an impact that lasts 0.22 ns or nanoseconds. Calculate the change of momentum of the molecule. So change in momentum then. We know that it's going initially at 420 meters per second. The velocity is then reversed. There's no change in speed, so it becomes minus 420 meters per second. That's all going to be fine. We work out what the change in momentum is. Uh, we can do it a couple of ways. You can either do minus 420 times by 5 times 10 to the minus 26, and then take away from that 420 times 5 times 10 to the minus 26. Uh, I've tried to put it all in as one go here by doing mass is uh, mass times by final velocity takeaway. Initial velocity gives you the same answer. Comes out as minus 4.2 times 10 to the minus 23 kilogram meters per second. We then want to work out the force on the molecule. The force on the molecule is changing momentum over time. So we do minus 4.2 times 10 to the minus 23 over 0.22 times 10 to the minus 9. Remember nano is 10 to the minus 9. That comes out as minus 1.91 times 10 to the minus 13 newtons. Okay, the challenge question for today then is about an oblique impact. It says a molecule of mass 5 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms moving at a speed of 420 meters per second hits a surface at 60 degrees to the normal and rebounds without a loss of speed as shown in the diagram. The contact time between the molecule and the surface is 0.22 nanoseconds and we want to calculate the change in momentum of the molecule. Now, to do this then, we're going to have to be considering the different components of the momentum because we've got a momentum of the molecule acting downwards and obviously a momentum going perpendicularly to the wall as shown. So, the initial momentum we can split up into mu sine theta. If I get the laser pointer out, that might help me to show where that's come from. So here's the molecule before impact, and we know that the velocity is 420. We can split up that velocity of 420 into 420 sine theta here, as shown by the laser pointer, because that's the opposite side of the right angle triangle. And then this here will be cos 60, because this is per, uh, the adjacent side of the triangle. So you've got sine 60, and cos 60. Put the laser pointer away. So the initial momentum then is mu sine theta plus mu cos theta. Now the component going downwards is unchanged in the final momentum that is still mu sine theta. However, you can see that the molecule has changed direction along the normal line and is acting in the opposite direction, so would now be m minus mu cos theta. Change in momentum is final momentum take away initial momentum. So mu sine theta take away mu sine theta will cancel out. That leaves us with minus mu cos theta minus mu cos theta, which gives minus 2 mu cos theta. We substitute the values in here, so we'll do minus 2 times 5 times 10 to the minus 26 times by 420 times by cos 60, and that gives us a final answer of minus 2.1 times 10 to the minus 23 kilogram meters per second. We now want to work out the force that the surface exerts on the molecule. Well, as it has been for the rest of the video, force is change in momentum divided by time. So we do that change in momentum that we've just worked out, divided by 0.22 times 10 to the minus 9, which gives us minus 9.55 times 10 to the minus 14 newtons. We then want to calculate the force that the molecule exerts on the surface. Well, that is a Newton's third law problem. If the surface puts a force of minus 9.55 times 10 to the minus 14 on the molecule, then the molecule will put a force of plus 9.55 times 10 to the minus 14 Newtons on the actual surface. And that comes from Newton's third law.